Southern Japan is being battered by powerful Typhoon Jalawat. The storm has injured dozens so far in Okinawa Prefecture. The 17th Typhoon of the year is now bearing down on the Tanegashima Island in Kagoshima Prefecture. Japan's Meteorological Agency reports that Jalawat was about 230 kilometers east-southeast of Tanegashima Island. They say the typhoon was heading northeast at 45 kilometers per hour. The forecasters say winds near the center of the storm were blowing at 162 kilometers per hour. The typhoon is projected to stretch from the Kansai region to Kanto by Sunday afternoon. Jalabat has already caused numerous problems. Wind overturned the truck on the road in Naha City in Okinawa. Maintenance workers are still struggling to restore electricity to more than 260,000 households that were left without power in Okinawa and Kagoshima prefectures. Evacuation advisories have been issued for about 9,300 residents in Kagoshima prefecture. The Jalawat has injured more than 80 people so far in Okinawa and Kagoshima prefectures. Japan's Science and Technology Ministry says the average radiation level one meter above ground within an 80 kilometer radius of the Fukushima Daiichi plant fell by more than 20 percent during the seven months through June. Radiation levels were calculated using data collected both on the ground and in the air using a helicopter in June. The average radiation level at about 140,000 locations within 80 kilometer radius of the plant fell by about 23 percent from early November of last year to June. The decrease was almost 10 percentage points higher than 14 percent, the amount attributed to natural decline. The ministry says that radioactive materials may have been washed away by rain and adds it will continue to carry out the survey as flight routes of the helicopters may have influenced the data collected. One day some twisted son of a bitch is bound to teach you a thing or two about living in this cold, godforsaken world. Okay, um, John Collins was a guy pretty high up in the NRC structure. And this is what he had to say about off-site monitoring. Uh, Collins said, my problem, the concern I have about aerial monitoring is that for the first three days, we were pretty much into a very static air condition. There was very little dispersion. When you're flying your helicopter and taking your aerial measurements, you're actually reading erroneous readings. I really doubt some of the measurements that were made. You know, if you watch a helicopter do a rescue, what happens? It's taking clean air from up above and blowing it down and pushing the water out. Well, the same thing was happening with the aerial surveys around TMI. The helicopter was taking clean air and blowing it down on the radiation detectors that hung below. Uh, so. Uh, the, I agree with Collins that whatever came off the helicopters is erroneous. Um, second is that the wind was very light, and this is important in a river valley site, and I think uh, rolls into what Dr. Wind will show. Um, in a river valley site, in the morning, um, you get very, very static air, and the plume was meandering, but it wasn't traveling very fast, and that's a concern. Uh, more on Collins. Not only should we have good monitors, but also people who understand how to use them. That was a problem since day one. They get the data and no one sits down and evaluates the data to try to understand what it means. This is the NRC talking about the data which was recorded off-site after the accident. And the last and what probably the most important is they had to chase the plume in a car. Now as I was explaining, the plume variation from the center of the plume six degrees off. If you miss the plume by 600 feet You'd, have, you'd be measuring 1,000 or 10,000 times less radiation than was on the center line. So when you hear about a person being exposed and you know, the, the metallic taste or there's some <coughs> air loss issues or something like that, and perhaps <coughs> the neighbor wasn't, well, the reason was that the dispersion of the plume was, was very narrow. And you could easily have a factor of 10,000, according to a Dr. Bergeiner, who's the meteorologist on the job, um, when you look just 600 feet off at a mile, it would be about 1,200 feet off at two miles. But again, the further out you go, you just have to move a couple hundred feet off the center of the plume to have a dramatic difference in the amount of radiation you see. Um, and on top of that, the NRC's estimate is, did I flick that just as you were taking that picture? Yeah. Okay. 
for a minute. Um, the NRC, the, the time averaging of the dispersion can cause a tenfold error. Being on the center line of the plume versus being off the plume by just a little bit can cause a thousand. I put here, in fact, some of the data says a 10,000 fold error. And averaging the data changes it by about a factor of three. The net effect is that the NRC's 10 million could be wrong a thousand fold. A group of children in Japan's northeastern Fukushima prefecture have been blessed with a few good memories. The kids in Minami Soma City took part in their first outdoor sporting event since last year's accident at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. Until the end of September last year, Minami Soma was included in an evacuation zone. The kindergarten says radiation levels in the playground are about 0.2 microsieverts per hour. The school usually only allows the children to play outside for half an hour for safety reasons. But the kindergarten decided to hold the event so that the children can begin to enjoy as normal a life as possible. It's good. Life has still not returned to normal yet, but I'm glad that children can enjoy some good memories from the festival. Explosions at the chemical factory in Hyogo Prefecture, Western Japan, claimed the life of, more, life of one fisherman and left one fireman, rather, and left 30 others injured. Firefighters in Himeji City responded to a call on Saturday afternoon after a fire suddenly broke out at the Nippon Shokubai chemical factory. Before they had a chance to extinguish the blaze, a huge explosion occurred. When I heard the blast, the doors of my house shook like an earthquake. 
One firefighter died in the blast, which also injured 18 firefighters, 10 factory workers and two police officers. Police say that after the fire, uh, first tank containing acrylic acid exploded, a second tank with the same chemical and a third containing toluene acid also exploded. Firefighters worked for eight hours to finally bring the blaze under control. Authorities are investigating the cause of the fire.